This is Mishmash, a weekly conversation where we try to unjumble an important and sometimes under the radar statewide story that affects you. I'm Alethea Kasten. And I'm Zach Orchow. Former President Donald Trump has made it clear he wants to increase his support among Black voters this November 5th. Any increase in support would, of course, help his efforts to be reelected to the White House. But questions remain on what his campaign can realistically do. These are traditionally Democratic voters overwhelmingly, right, Alethea? Right. So Black voters nationwide overwhelmingly support Democratic candidates for president, for, and they've done this for more than 50 years. In 2016, an estimated 92% of Black voters backed Hillary Clinton over Trump. In 2020, 90% of Black voters backed President Joe Biden over Trump, which was a slight increase for the Republican. This year, a recent poll from the New York Times showed Trump could get support from 15 percent of black voters. And this is causing a lot of discussion and questions about whether that could possibly be true. And you can see the dynamics playing out in Detroit, one of the country's largest majority black cities. Trump did manage to get about 5000 more votes out of the city in 2020 than he did in 2016. But in the context of losing the state by 154000 votes to Joe Biden, not a big difference. If Trump could even get himself from that paltry 5% of the vote he got in Detroit in 2020 to, say, 10%, it's not a great number, but it would be a huge piece of the puzzle for him to win statewide. I mean, clearly these campaigns recognize how critical the Detroit vote is to the statewide result. And Michigan Democrats continually work in the city, which is a key base of their support, albeit not without disagreement on if those outreach efforts are enough. I mean, President Obama was wrapping M&M in Detroit. I mean, (laughs) my goodness, how much more critical must it be? So this all raises an interesting question on why Black voters are expected to provide 90 plus percent support to the Democratic candidates. That seems kind of unfair in a lot of ways. It's just been uh, historical uh, patterns. State Senator Sylvia Santana was on Mishmash a few weeks ago and noted it's important for Detroit voters to be treated like individuals. Not everyone votes the same way. And Jamel Hill, a Detroit native who now writes for The Atlantic, joined us on Mishmash this week. She touched on this issue, and here's what she had to say. To me, this is a very tired story. Nicole Hedda Jones, the dynamite writer uh, for the New York Times who brought the 1619 Project, I thought she said something that was really important. Why are Black people the only group expected to 100% have loyalty to one party? The way that the Black vote is covered Um, on a political um, scale is always that there's this expectation that we all have to have uh, this 100 percent loyalty to the Democratic Party. And if they if we don't, it's something wrong. And if we're going to have that conversation about loyalty to party, why don't we ever have the conversation about how white voters have 50 percent of white voters haven't voted for a Democratic presidential nominee since Linda B. Johnson? So why are we having that conversation? And other demographics that are key in how the race shakes out don't necessarily have the same kind of coverage or expectation. You know, for example, 47 percent of white women supported Trump in 2016. That increased to 53 percent in 2020. A key voting block for Trump has been white voters without college degrees who have overwhelmingly supported him both in 2016 and 2020, with roughly 65 percent backing him both years. So for as much as Democrats retaining their historic 90 percent support among black voters dominates discussion, it should not be forgotten the major shift from 2016 to 2020 was that Trump lost a huge portion of support Republican candidates traditionally had with voters with college degrees. You know, every vote counts the same. We're going to take a short break, but stick around because when we come back, we're talking with Jamel Hill about the election, politics in Detroit, where she grew up and much more. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Mishmash. I'm Alethea Kasdan. And I'm Zach Orchow. Now, bear with this longer than usual introduction because we have a very exciting guest. She is an MSU alumna who covered Spartan sports for the Detroit Free Press and then became a sports columnist for the Orlando Sentinel. This is like a smart list level build up to the guest. I'll just warn you right now. She then burst onto the national scene at ESPN as a reporter and host and is now a contributing writer for The Atlantic writing on the intersection of sports and politics. She's the author of a memoir, Uphill. She's a Detroit native, and most importantly, a fellow alumni of the State News, America's greatest college newspaper. Jamel Hill, 
Welcome, Jamal. We're so excited to have you here. That's right, Zach. Let them know. Greatest <laughs> college newspaper ever created, the State News. So happy to be with both of you. So, Jamal, you've had your foot in both the sports and the politics world. Um, and as much as Zach would like to focus this podcast on sports, <laughs> it is a politics uh, podcast. So, you know, you recently wow. interviewed Governor Whitmer. Um, you know, what was your takeaway from that interview? I, I thought it was fun. I got the governor to curse. That's always awesome. <laughs> um, but uh, that you're referring to our sit down at the Atlantic Festival, which is held every year. They like to invite um, noteworthy political people um, to come and, and to have conversations about the state of politics. And so uh, I was just honored that they asked me, of course, given my ties to Michigan, I think it makes sense. And that was not the first time that the governor and I um, have been in company uh, with one another. We actually, the, the more recent or before we had the sit down interview at the uh, NAACP's uh, Freedom Fund dinner in Detroit, we sat next to each other and, <laughs> and uh, we had a good time. It was, it was fun. So she's got a, a very outgoing personality. Um, you know, obviously being from Detroit and, and, and being here from Michigan, I keep tabs on some of the things that are happening here. Um, politically, socially, and otherwise. I still read the free press every day. <laughs> um, and so, uh, you know, it's really, um, yeah, it was, it was really an honor. But my takeaway from it, you know, I think it's the most important part of it is that, you know, are, are is she going to be able to look, deliver Michigan for the Republican Party? Not that it's all on her necessarily, yeah, but that's the sort Democratic of, Party. The Democratic yes. Party. Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, yes, is she going to be able to um, deliver this state? Um, in what is a very critical election. So we spent a lot of time talking about that, particularly since uh, when Biden was the nominee and during the primary, you had 100,000 uncommitted voters um, or 100,000 people who voted uncommitted, rather, uh, mm -hmm. to, to, to say that more clearly. But uh, and just where, given what the U.S.'s strategy is as it relates to Israel, how that has become a, a really thorny issue um, for this party. And so, uh, you know, I thought she answered as best that she could. Um, and, you know, she admitted this, this don't be a fight. Like, I mean, this, I think you all know that the polling mm -hmm. seems to change and go back and forth and fluctuate uh, every time Michigan comes up. So it, it'll be interesting to see what happens on Election Day. And you know, Jamel, Governor Whitmer, of course, is at the center of politics in Michigan. Um, but I'm wondering what your sense is of how she's viewed nationally. Yeah, it, it is interesting because I, I do think nationally people do look at her as a, a political rock star. I mean, that's always the impression I got. I mean, I, I think um, certainly Donald Trump singling her out uh, when he was president, I think, really raised her national profile. And nationally, um, she is like regarded as a, a really good governor. Now, obviously, when you live in the state, you're going to get a lot more mixed opinions <laughs> of that. Yeah, we hear some of that. Yes, sure. exactly. You're going to get some mixed opinions. And, and that's kind of normal in the political discourse. But I think nationally, she's looked at very favorably. And before Kamala Harris um, became the nominee, a lot of people brought up her name as somebody who potentially could be a nominee. I didn't see that happening necessarily, but uh, I understand why her name surfaced, which lets you know that people nationally have a very high opinion of her. Yeah, it's interesting being in the Michigan bubble um, and seeing how she's viewed nationally. I do think, I agree. I think rock star is a great term for that because I think she is incredibly you know, popular on the national stage. I'm curious why you think... Um, she, there wasn't more of a conversation that included her as a potential nominee. Um, you know, you said you didn't really see that as a realistic option. You know, mm -hmm. why not when because Biden I, dropped out? I, and this would, this was my general opinion for, I guess, if you want to put it in the in the bucket of people who we feel like, or most people feel like, will be, you know, uh, people who run in the future. I think if you're her, if you're Westmore, you probably wanted your own political campaign, and you wanted your own time to be able to build. Um, more of a political reputation. Not, that's not to say that she doesn't already have one, but you're kind of piggybacking on something else. And if if I'm them, that's how I would look at it. Whereas Kamala Harris was a part of the administration, so it's a different uh, it, it's a different strategy for her as opposed to you know Governor Whitmer, who as much as she is known nationally, there's still a lot of people who don't know who she is. So I think the runway would have been much shorter for her. And uh, if there was one candidate who did have the ability to, um, you know, get more acquainted or 
or should I say, get further entrenched in, in terms of the, the national discourse, it was Kamala Harris because she'd already been in office for a, a few years. And so Gretchen Whitmer, I think it would have been more starting, a little bit more starting from scratch, Westmore, like some of the other names, like they, Shapiro, they, they all would have had to start from scratch in a much different way. And if you're them and you really see that uh, becoming president is like a viable option for you, you want your own campaign and you want a few years to build up that momentum to run. So, Jamel, as you know, there's been a ton of talk about whether the former president, Donald Trump, might reduce the traditionally large majority of votes the Democratic presidential candidate wins among Black voters. So Detroit, 78% of the population is Black. It was 94 to 5 Biden to Trump <laughs> right. in 2020. I mean, this is a long story. This has been true for, you know, really since the, the early 80s, I would say where the Democratic candidates are putting up those kinds of margins. So it seems hard to imagine, for me anyways, that Trump could reduce that margin significantly, particularly Vice President Harris, the first woman of color as a major party presidential nominee. But what's your assessment? on Are, are there di any dynamics that are changing? You know, even if Trump could go from 5 to 10 percent, it would be important as right. far as trying to win Michigan. I, I just, to me, this is a very tired story. Um, and it's a story that has existed in the political landscape since Mitt Romney. I remember mm -hmm. even then they were more black people are going to vote for Mitt Romney. Yeah. Then it was more black people are going to vote for Donald Trump. It's like we've been through this too many times. And another I won't take credit for this observation um, because she's way smarter than me and she's a fantastic journalist. But Nicole Hannah Jones, the dynamite writer uh, for The New York Times, who brought the 1619 Project, I thought she said something that was really important. Why are black people the only the only group expected to 100 percent have loyalty to one party. And I, I get what the voting trends are. I get that black people have been voting Democratic, largely tied to the two key pieces uh, in history, being the Voting Rights Act and also the Civil Rights Act. And so Democrats have consistently been able um, to hold a significant uh, amount of, uh, of power in the black community. Right. So I understand the legacy and the history. And that's why that's there. Um, but yet it's still, again, <laughs> the way that the black vote is covered um, on a political um, scale is always that there's this expectation that we all have to have uh, this 100 percent loyalty to the Democratic Party. And if, they, if we don't, there's something wrong. And if we're going to have that conversation about loyalty to party, why don't we ever have the conversation about how white voters have 50 percent of white voters haven't voted for a Democratic presidential nominee since Linda B. Johnson? So why are we having that conversation, right? We don't, right? It's only having the conversation if there's some uh, poll that shows that, yes, there will be more Black people voting for Donald Trump. I personally don't sense that. And, uh, you know, I think it'll be probably about the same as it was. Uh, if you're Kamala Harris, when it comes to earning the Black vote, it's, it's the Black vote versus the couch. Like, her competition is the couch. It's people staying at home. Um, I don't think her competition for the Black community is is realistically and legitimately Donald Trump, who has not really offered anything or any substantial reasons why he should have earned the Black community's vote. I mean, the only thing he's really offered is giving the police full immunity. Like, there, there's no... And so even, even in that, even among the voter base, I've had those conversations a lot. Like, why are the expectations to have a Black agenda only on one candidate? Where is Donald Trump's Black agenda? He doesn't have one. Okay, so that, so to me, a, a lot of sort of the conversation and even the coverage, it gets a little exhausting because I feel like we've been through this so many times before and talking about more, you know, more Black people are going to be voting Republican and it literally never happens. It, it's funny you mentioned the Romney cycle because here in, in Michigan, the, the Republicans... You know, I, I get it. They want to win. They're trying to, you know, sell a good story. Um, but, you know, they were convinced that turnout among black voters was going to fall off the table for President Obama in 2012. And to say the least, that did not that happen. That did not happen. Right. <laughs> that did not happen. So um, great observations. Thank you. Well, and I think, you know, like the increase in um, Detroit voters in particular for Trump, there was a slight increase from mm -hmm. 2016 to 2020, but you know, it's nominal, you know, it's like 2000, 3000 votes. And I would, I would expect that again, right? Yeah. Like I would expect some nominal increase. Yeah. So like not, they're saying I'm going to get 25% no, of not, the black I vote. Like I don't it. really think you're going to increase 12% <laughs> in one cycle. I think that's really difficult, but in terms of sort of the enthusiasm and the turnout, I'm wondering, do you think 
the comments that Trump has been making about Detroit. I think he made some more yesterday. He made some in Detroit. Do you think that helps get more voters off the couch or do you think that just kind of solidifies there? I was already voting for Harris. So uh, the uh, the unfortunate part is that I don't think he can actually like there's no floor for him. Right. Like the, the, he can't he can come out and have uh, an entire thesis essay. He could do a 20 minute speech about how Detroit is you know, some of the words that he referred to Detroit as. And I, I don't think that moves the needle that much. Um, you know, I, and if, uh, it, which is a shame because I think to some degree, some of this or a lot of this should be completely disqualifying. Now, again, it, this gets back to the question and the conversation we just had a second ago about winning the black vote. How is insulting the, <laughs> the blackest city in this state going to help you win more black votes? It's not. So I can't even take it seriously when people want to have a conversation about him winning votes, when it's not just Detroit, it's Baltimore. It's like the blackest cities in the country, he has insulted them all at some point. Um, and so, but I do hope that it does, because I believe, and you guys can correct me because you would know better than me. I think, I, I feel like the uh, the voter turnout um, in 2020, it was something like 49%, I think in Detroit. That's about right. Yeah, it was 49%. So I'm hoping to your point that, that is that becomes in the high 50s, if not in the 60s. And when you see someone who potentially could be in office that thinks that low of your city, I'm hoping that will maybe the undecided, maybe the I don't know if I want to vote. Maybe that crowd may hopefully be a little more uh, amped up to actually engage themselves in, in this election. And really, to me, the the disappointing thing about his um, comments, his continued comments about Detroit, because they didn't just start this year. He's said other things about Detroit in, in, in previous years, is that it shouldn't be just Detroiters upset at that. It should be everybody in the state because Detroit is the biggest city and, you know, a crown jewel in many regards. And the people who are in Detroit see how it, much it has changed. Like I think about the Detroit I grew up with versus the Detroit I see now. They're two totally different places. You know, when I was growing up in Detroit, it was six, 700 murders a year. Easy, right? And downtown, there was no department stores downtown. Now you go to downtown Detroit, and I know it's not just about downtown, but you go to downtown Detroit, they had a Gucci store in downtown Detroit. <laughs> like I, I never thought I would see that. A Gucci store, Under Armour, Nike, Apple store, Rihanna just opened her own store down in. So there's clearly, it, it, Detroit has had many stops and starts, but this one just feels a lot more sustainable and it's having reach. My old neighborhood, I went back to it the last time I was um, in Detroit and there's boutiques, coffee shops. There are like things that did not exist. They got a, uh, they got a little island so people can't speed. I was like, what is going on? <laughs> so it's become kind of hipster, which is weird. Uh, so I, I see, uh, I think a lot of people see the potential and how Detroit has really revitalized. I mean, one of the hottest housing markets in the country. I mean, there's a lot of good things. So not only were his comments insulting, they were also highly inaccurate. So what's your sense of the national impression of Michigan in the presidential race? I mean, obviously there's not many competitive states. Michigan's one of them. But I'm curious, just when you you talk to folks, they know you're a Michigan native. What, what do they think about where Michigan's at in this race? I'm asked a lot about what's Michigan going to do, right? Because I, I think people do understand, you know, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, these are the swing states that are um, in question. They So Michigan, in, in terms of the national conversation, is very important politically. Now, I live in, in California, and I, I think we pretty much know how California is going to go, right? right? And and people there have said, like, wow, you, you sure you can't vote in Michigan? I was like, I, I can't. <laughs> I haven't lived there. <laughs> it's been a while. So sorry. But I but I think people nationally very much understands that, uh, that if Kamala Harris wins Michigan, that's like an important piece in terms of her possibly uh, becoming the president. So um, I think people definitely understand the importance. What people, uh, I think what they didn't know um, before about Detroit, I don't, you know, it feels like we sort of have this conversation every few years, but I don't think people were aware of how big the Arab population was in Detroit. And because, you know, uh, the war in Gaza and the conflict has become such a central issue um, in how each candidate will respond, knowing that part of Michigan, uh, you know, because I think Michigan still has the largest air population outside of the Middle East. So people not knowing that they're just like, oh, OK, so there's some real, um, you know, imp important that further elevates the important of, 
importance of, of winning this uh, of winning this state. So, like, I think nationally, people understand very much that Michigan is like a huge part of whoever becomes president. Um, during the last almost two years now, uh, we've seen, you know, complete democratic control of state government in Michigan. Uh, how much do you think sort of that change has registered nationally? Do you get the sense that, you know, this is something people outside of Michigan are noticing? I don't think they know that. And um, <laughs> that, that part, like they know about uh, Governor Gretchen mm-hmm. Whitmer, but I don't think they understand like, hey, here, the Secretary of State, Democrat, you have the Attorney General, um, it's a, a Democrat controlled house. And I don't know, when was the last time that happened? Like it's it, 40 years. It was, yeah, I thought it was like 40 <laughs> years. It's been a while. So I don't think people are aware that part of the reason that Gretchen Whitmer has been able to be as successful as she's become and uh, and moving the state forward and the progress here is because, you know, she's been able to run the table. And so or her partner has been able to run the table in the state. Um I also, I mean, as an outside observer, I guess what has surprised me is watching how the GOP in Michigan has is very fractured. Like it is I don't think I've ever seen the party this way in this state, like the entire time, certainly when I was living here. Um, So that part has been like really surprising seeing what has what things look like on the other side. To your point. I also don't think people understand how important the Senate race is here uh, when you think about. Um, you know, what could potentially be at stake beyond just the the president um, in this election. I mean, we're talking about the fact that there likely will be two Supreme Court justice openings. Like there's expected to be two retirements. Um, So that means, you know, who who controls the Senate is a major piece to that. And as we've seen with previous presidents, um, you know, if you're able to have both, you know, the White House and the Senate, (laughs) That goes a long way into what you can accomplish in your agenda, as it did for Joe Biden. The fact that Kamala Harris is the tie-breaking vote uh, because of what they were able to do um, in, in Georgia in terms of turning that state blue. And so I think that that alone played a significant role in how his presidential legacy will be regarded sort of years from now. So I think people have to understand that it's not just about Kamala Harris winning Michigan. If you're, uh, if you're a Democrat, it's about can... Um, Slot can also win the Senate seat because if that doesn't happen, you know, and especially the, the the given what's happening in Texas with Colin Allred and Ted Cruz, like the Senate races are probably one A in terms of the importance in this national election. So we're recording on Wednesday, October sixteenth, because you're in Lansing <laughs> for an event at uh, all of our alma mater, uh, Michigan State University, hosted by the Atlantic. Um, so what's the Atlantic doing in Michigan today? And elsewhere leading up to the election. So the Atlantic, um, you know, they they've uh, they they have put together a bunch of events at colleges, I think, in key states to talk about voting, to talk about democracy. And, um, you know, if you read as the time of this recording, the, the current issue of the Atlantic for only the fifth time in the Atlantic's history, they actually endorsed a presidential candidate. Mm-hmm. They endorsed Kamala Harris um, and. You know, I, I think I feel like they did this the last time with Joe Biden. I was like, was that the last time? But anyway, they uh, they rarely do this, even though they're a political magazine. So I think this is sort of in line, um, you know, with that endorsement. And also, I, I think in generally, generally speaking, um, the Atlantic has like a long history of, you know, uh, obviously prioritizing democracy and what that means, because as we know, uh, as all as journalists, is that the key to a democracy is a free press. And so uh, so this is just kind of part of their overall mission. And it's one of the many reasons why uh, when I left ESPN, I wanted to write for The Atlantic. Uh, one, I wanted to return to writing because that's always going to be my first love. And two, it felt, um, you know, I wanted to be connected with a media outlet that was still prioritizing journalism. Now, I'm not saying The Atlantic gets it right every time, but they get it right most times um, in terms of just their general approach to to journalism. And also, I guess I would say a third reason is writing about, being able to write about uh, the intersection between sports, race, gender, politics, and culture at a out, for an outlet that wasn't in any way tied to any of the sports leagues, right? So it's like, you know, when you're at ESPN, it's like they have a billion dollar deal with the NFL. They have a billion dollar deal with Major League Baseball. And while nobody from uh, the executive offices ever came down and told me what I couldn't say about these leagues, the reality is as the old adage goes, what's understood need not be said. So uh, <laughs> you know what the, 
you know, you know that that is a relationship. A bu- there's a business relationship there, so it feels good to be able to write um, and and write about sports in a way without having to worry about oh, they have this this uh, wealthy relationship with any of the leagues that I, I discussed. But yes, the event is on campus. It's, uh, it'll be at the Wharton Center, and so I'm excited. Um, to talk to uh, students and the general public. We'll be meeting with some students before the event takes place to, to talk a little bit about journalism and as a career path. And so not sure what I'm going to tell them, but I'm going to think so. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are competing with our Mishmash Live event. Tonight, <laughs> yeah. so oh, we will, oh, I'm sorry We'll forgive that. you okay, for that. <laughs> <laughs> so we would be committing po- a podcast violation if we didn't talk about your podcast that'll be launching soon. Um, can you tell us about politics? Yeah, uh, my my podcast launches October 17th. And um, uh, on iHeart Podcast and, you know, available on Apple's or wherever you get your podcast. But for a long time, I've wanted to do a sports and politics podcast. And I know you always get a loud and angry group saying, oh, I don't want my politics and my sports mixed together. Like, uh, you know, like you're serving them a meal and they're like, the vegetables can't touch the meat. You know, it's like, no. <laughs> uh, if we think about sports uh, in a wider sense, uh, everything, politics touches everything, number one. And so this sort of naive idea that it somehow doesn't have an impact or influence on sports is always been kind of crazy to me when we have so much evidence that suggests or that tells us otherwise. I mean, the moment that you go to a stadium or you go to an arena, it's a taxpayer funded stadium. It's a taxpayer funded arena. So inherently that is political. You know, we have military flyovers at games that is political. All right. So whether you want it, want it or not, the sports and the politics are always mixing. Um, and, you know, as we've seen throughout history, that sports, because it's one of the few unifying things that we do, like, you know, we're we live in a pretty segregated society. You know, we all have our own friends, our own communities, and we kind of stick to those. Sports is the one thing that brings us together. So to me, that gives it the perfect opportunity to talk about political issues, particularly when you see athletes engaging in politics all the time. You know, I was just reading before we um, you know, started this podcast about the Kansas City kicker, Harrison Bucker, like how he, uh, well, one, he's campaigning with J.D. Vance, and he's also um, starting a super PAC, I believe. Uh, and so I was like, oh, well, didn't have that on the bingo card. Uh, so, you know, we see athletes engaging in, in politics quite a bit. And so I wanted to create a space to talk about that engagement, what that looks like, and how sports in many ways, and the athletes and the figures in them, are attacking, you know, political uh, issues. You know, like one of the key issues in our society is affordable housing. Well, I know there are a lot of athletes who are getting into creating affordable housing. So um, I'm excited about it. Uh, I've got some great people that will be on. My first episode is with Dan Lebitard, somebody who often mixes sports and, and, and politics. Uh, or as he likes to say, no, I talk about sports and race, but the race became politics. <laughs> right? And uh, he's got a fascinating story. He's the son of Cuban exiles. And, um, you know, uh, he and I had a great conversation about him being the son of Cuban exiles. And also um, when he attended Miami, uh, befriending, uh, uh, befriending black people about how it started to influence and shape his political views. So. I hope everybody checks it out again, available on iHeart Podcast, wherever you get your podcast. And also it will the video version of the podcast will be available on my YouTube page. Well, I, I wanted to tell our listeners out there, you should definitely check out the the trailer for on YouTube for this podcast. It has Jamel is a very funny person. Very <laughs> Thank you, Zach. funny person. It's an I don't underrated quality. Yes, Nobody ever has, talks about no, this. No, <laughs> and I don't want to spoil it, but the opening to it is very funny. I laughed out loud and I'm really excited about it. Going to definitely make it one of my regular listens. So I I could not forgive myself if we did not do kind of a lightning round of sports questions. Okay. So this will be yes or no, because you've got a busy schedule. You ready? I am ready. Okay. Will the Lions make the Super Bowl? Yes. So uh, the thing is, <laughs> I know you're like, why? Or why? Go ahead. You can you can expound upon. Okay. That I'll like. just a quick, just to quickly expound upon it. I am not a Lions fan. Right. We, right? we don't. Right? I don't. It's hard for me to talk about. I know. But go I ahead. know. My <laughs> husband, however, right. is Mr. Lions fan, yes. like huge Lions fan, and so. Um, but I, I can't lie. Like, I mean, I'm a 49ers fan for for all those who don't know. And so um, I just hope we don't 
play the Lions again, not because I don't think we can beat them, but just because it just creates warfare in my house <laughs> so, more than anything. But I would like to see the Lions make a Super Bowl because like what that would mean to the state, what that would mean to long suffering Lions fans. <laughs> Um, and what it would mean to my husband, I would willingly <laughs> sacrifice so that he can enjoy the, um, you know, enjoy the victory or, or enjoy that sort of Super Bowl experience. We bit, we went to the Super Bowl when the Rams um, were in the Super Bowl. Unfortunately, I hate the Rams. Um, but uh, and so, but to experience it as with your own team being in the Super Bowl, I, I like that for him. But the Lions look really good. They look like the maybe the best team in the NFC. The only reason I say maybe is because of Minnesota. Big game this week yeah. uh, as we're recording this or whatever. But the Lions are definitely a Super Bowl caliber team. Well, that's that's exciting and encouraging because I know you don't you're not going to butter up the hometown. You're no, going to tell it like it is. I will tell it like it is for sure. All right, next one. Will MSU basketball make another Final Four before Tom Izzo retires? Yes. All right. Cool. Mm -hmm. People may be able to see if you're watching us on YouTube. Jamel is wearing a Detroit Pistons t-shirt, which is a great way to do this last one. Will the Pistons find their way out of the lottery <laughs> by 2027? Yes, I think they will. I, I, listen, to me, the goal this season is, one, don't lose 30 straight games. I feel like they can do that, right? <laughs> goals, goals. Goals. Don't, yeah, win, don't right. lose 30 straight games. <laughs> but I think they can be relevant this year. Right. Like relevancy. And I, I know re relevancy is kind of a nebulous term, but I think they can at least advance to when you look at the schedule, if you're the opposing team, not counting it as an automatic win. I think there's going to be a lot of fight in them this season um, because, you know, listen, basketball, everything's very cyclical and it's a really downtime for the Pistons right now. But I, I think I think we're going to see some sparks. I think we're going to say, like, OK, I can see how this team could be the basis of a of a better of a playoff team down the road. Well, I was very fortunate many many years ago. We won't see how many to um, be just starting at the State News as Jamel was finishing up as managing editor, and she's just an amazing uh, person to be around. And lucky to still be in, in touch all these years later. So, Jamel, I just want to thank you for coming on Mishmash. Hope everything goes great with the Atlantic event, and thanks so much for joining us. Yes, and thank you all for having me. I I love having conversations about Michigan and. Uh, certainly about politics and about our alma mater. So you all mishmashed all three of those. So I love this. <laughs>